Hey, mister, someone said, and I looked up from the book that I'd been reading to see the kid on the bike posted up outside the gate. How much longer? I smiled. Next Monday's the grand opening, kid. Make sure you're there. Oh, you better believe it, he said, and the four kids turned and rode off, chattering happily about what they thought this year's event would be. I couldn't blame them. It was likely to be pretty exciting. It had been about a week and a half since the lady had come back from her Walmart visit, and for the first three days, she had been sequestered in her office, planning and thinking. She had come out to receive a sacrifice, some blubbering fellow who dried up pretty quickly once he made it to the lily pond, but had gone right back to her plans after that. I had a sneaking suspicion that she was gorging herself on all that candy that we had picked up, and after three days, the orders came down. On Monday, the park will close for a week of renovations before we open on to this year's Halloween extravaganza. We hadn't started putting someone on the gate until today, and the guy on the ladder had kind of forced our hand. The park had been completely redesigned, and even though I had seen it happen several times before, it was still a little dizzying. The presentation areas, 12 in all, had been transformed into Halloween exhibits. The lily pond was now a giant apple bobbing pool, with a statue of a witch overseeing all. Some of the apples had gummy worms in them too, something I'd been alarmed to discover, which was a nice touch. The lady would preside over this area, and she had her own witch costume that she seemed to be wearing any time I saw her moving through the park. It was a dark dress with hints of orange, the shoes curly, the hat particularly witchy. From here, the exhibits went on like this. The one o'clock area was a haunted maze of gnarled trees, their trunks made of snarling faces. Brandylow hid within it, not even bothering with glamour, and would startle people as they walked the trail. The two o'clock spot was more of the gnarled trees, but these seemed to grow a strange kind of sour apple that looked red and delicious. Visitors could pick them and eat them, and they were so tart that they made even me pucker. At the three o'clock spot was a witch's house, a cottage, another spot the lady would frequent, with a big smoking cauldron out front. The cauldron was full of apple cider, and it was a brew that you could smell from the front gate if the wind was right. At four o'clock was a massive garden where Tobias would talk about different herbs and plants that might be of interest to guests. We had to keep a few of these mixed in to keep our status as an educational garden, and Tobias was happy to flex his knowledge and play the part of herbologist. At the five o'clock spot stood a fairy tale forest complete with trees that grew different sorts of Halloween candy. It was a spot that would have put Willy Wonka to shame, and I was curious to know how the lady had managed to grow trees that could grow chocolate and caramel. At the six o'clock spot was the ticket booth, where we sold admission. The booth acted as a middle ground between the two. The park itself divided right up the middle. On the right side was a fantasy world of confection and wonder, and on the left side was a bustling farmland that looked like a working farm. The sun even seemed to shine a little brighter on the left side, and it was a little strange to stand at the ticket booth and try to look at both of them at once. At the seven o'clock spot was a hayride through a working farm scene. There were corn, beans, squash, and of course, pumpkins. Stalio drove the tractor while Ridley conducted the tour, and it worked out another educational stop during the festivities. At eight o'clock, we had a pumpkin patch. It was an even split between carved and uncarved, and I definitely had been keeping my distance from the carved ones. I had seen more than a few of them move, at least I think I had, and the mouths looked a little toothsome to me. At the nine o'clock spot, we had a corn maze. Well, that's not entirely true. The corn in the maze, if you looked closely, was candy corn, and the lady had managed to make it grow like regular corn. Neat, huh? I explained to her that it might ruin the maze if people stopped to eat it, but as Randy put in, who the hell actually wanted to eat candy corn? 
There were also corn balls lying in the path, and they seemed to roll about the straw like tumbleweeds. At the ten o'clock spot, there was a tree that grew an assortment of candied apples. Some were toffee, some were fudge, and some were candy-coated. Some had nuts, some had sprinkles, and others had nothing. The sheer variety of treats on display was extremely impressive, and I wasn't even sure how she had managed it. This grove was guarded by Randy, mostly because he had to keep the other brandy low out of it. Apparently, candy-coated apples were a big hit amongst my fellow brandy low. And finally, at the 11 o'clock spot, we had a build-your-own scarecrow stand, complete with clothes that had been donated by local businesses. There were large bins surrounding the bales of hay. The kids, or adults, or whoever, could come up and stuff the clothes with hay to their heart's content. And afterwards, there was a contest twice a day for the best scarecrow. It was fun for the whole family. And that brings us back to the 12 o'clock spot again. The lily pond was another place that had to be observed, because some of the brandy low had taken to bobbing on their breaks. The goats could eat up to two dozen apples a day, if you let them, and more than one had been laid up with a bellyache. No matter how many they ate, however, all the apples and candy always came back. It was a little weird, but I supposed it would be ideal once people started coming in. All that explanation just to tell you that we had been working our furry asses off for the last three days. The treats, the hay, the apples, the vegetables all grew on their own, but they did need to be placed in the appropriate spots. We had done it at night so that no one would notice the tops of trees moving, but it was very odd to direct plants around. It reminded me of the scene from Fantasia where Mickey directs the brooms with magic. Trees shambled along on their thick roots, corn stalks and pumpkin plants on their smaller ones, and all of them tried to run into each other as Brandilo directed them into place. It was done by the time the sun came up, but it had been a long night. It was Tuesday before the man on the ladder was spotted, though I guess he may have just been unseen Monday. Becky had spotted him, perched against the wall with binoculars, and she had acted like she hadn't noticed before breaking off to tell Randy. When Randy and I had snuck around, Randy tapping the bottom of the ladder and clearing his throat, the man had nearly stumbled off the end of the ladder. He had turned around, binoculars bumping his chest, and smiled sheepishly at us. I don't suppose you'd care to give me an interview about this year's festivities. Nah, if you don't get out of here and take your ladder with you, you'll be watching the festivities from jail after we trespass you. The man's smile slipped as he came down the ladder. No need for that, I'll, I'll go. He had come back this morning, but I'd seen him pull into the parking lot, hence why I was still in the booth. He had seen me as well and kept going, and that had been all of it today. Border guards had become part of the daily work, too, and it'd be a relief to have the place open again. All this was beginning to feel like regular work. Hey, kid. I looked up to find Randy standing in the doorway. I checked my watch. It's not time for me to knock off yet. I'm here till sunset, right? Boss lady wants to see you. She sounded pretty stressed, so I didn't argue. I marked my page and got up not wanting to keep her waiting. Did she say why? Randy shook his head, probably looking for more ideas for the park. Maybe get her to make something that's not going to rot kids' teeth out? I told him I'd try and headed into the park. I found her in the farm area near the 10 o'clock spot. She was wearing her witch costume, but she didn't look good. She'd been working herself to the bone lately, burning her candle at both ends, and it was clear that she wanted to make this the best celebration ever. She was changing some of the candy apples, randomizing the types hanging there again and again, and when I touched her shoulder, she jumped and turned around like she might attack me. Oh, good, I, I need your help. It's not enough, I, I need more. What else can I add? More, more candy? More games? More, my lady, I said, reaching out to cup one of her hands in both of mine. You've done so much. It's enough. Just take a break. I had expected her to laugh, maybe to nod and breathe, but the brief 
flash of anger almost made me release her hand. It was brief, a sudden flash of heated rage, but it passed like summer heat lightning. She went from being a terrifying, rage-filled supernova to the woman I had spent so many afternoons talking and walking with. She smiled, clearly seeing my residual fear, and quickly changed gears. You, you, you're right, of course, of course you're right. I'm being silly. We, we have four days with which to refine this place, and I, I can't believe how quickly it's come together. She looked around, her smile unfolding like spring flowers. Nothing, nothing will stop our festivities this year. I started to tell her not to tempt fate when I heard hooves clattering on the concrete. My lady... Tobias yelled. Someone has arrived. She breathed in, nostrils flaring. Has the Green Knight reared his head so soon? No, it's someone from the Fay Court. They say we're being audited. What? The lady asked, not seeming to understand. That's what they said, Tobias elaborated. It said they had been sent out by the court and that we were being audited. The lady was in motion, walking towards the front with long, haughty steps. We fell in beside her, Tobias and I, and I was unsure of what was to come. The court had sent out an auditor. Did that mean something different to them than it did in my world? Was an auditor like a judge to the Fae? Like an executioner, maybe? Are, are we in trouble? I asked, trying to keep my pace with the lady and my friend. We are angry, the lady growled. An auditor. They dare send an auditor to me. I will cut them to ribbons. I will know why Titania has insulted me in such a way. Wait, Tobias said. Do you believe... Do you believe she is challenging you? The lady was silent for half a moment. I do not know. We shall see. We met the auditor by the front gate, Randy, cudgel in hand, already tapping his foot. I was a little unsure about fairies, something I guess I was now, sort of, but this one had to be the most normal-looking one I'd ever seen. He was tan, his hair cut short like a bristle brush, and the suit he wore was a deep forest green. The only whimsical touch he bore were his shoes, the boots were brown and green, earth tones, but the tips were decidedly pointy. He looked like the guy who does Santa's taxes. Maybe he was. Lady, comma, the, he said, and it wasn't a question. I am Kale. I have been sent to undertake an audit on your domain. His voice was the equivalent of warm oatmeal, and he sounded like he could go on for hours about the topics he knew. Tobias and he were going to get along great. For what purpose have you come to hinder my work? We are preparing for the fall celebration, and our work is not yet complete. Kale was clearly used to people responding with anger, because he showed no hesitation, and it didn't slow him down in the least bit. Queen Titania has received reports of aberrations and affronts to the natural order. I have been dispatched to audit this horticultural anomaly and make my own assessment. The lady set her jaw, nodding as she turned to Randy. Randy, can you and your deputy take Kale about and show him the things he requires? Ma'am, Kale said, stepping past Randy as he stepped forward, hand extended. It is customary for the party being audited to remain with the auditor until such matters are concluded. The lady flared her nostrils, and some of that anger I had seen earlier reared its head again. I have a thousand things to do. I do not have time to play hostess today. Randy is my champion, the captain of my guard, and he is fully capable of acting as my proxy. Randy, show him our exhibits, and or show him the door. I do not have time to entertain these things today. Then she walked away, and we were left to watch as the very normal-looking Fay cleared his throat indignantly and looked at Randy. 
Very well then, Randall, was it? Randy, he growled back, indicating that the Fae should follow him, and we proceeded into the garden. Kale, sure enough, had about a thousand questions about everything. We took him to the candy forest first, since it was closer. The trees here were more fairy tale than spooky, pines and evergreens. I wasn't really sure what he counted as an aberration or an anomaly, and it appeared that neither was Randy. We just figured we would show him around and see what he made of it. He smirked at the candy trees, making notes before looking at Randy as if to say, What else? He was equally as unimpressed with the witch's cottage and the garden, but we did finally find something that caught his interest. Tobias, tending the vegetables and making notes, had broken off when we left the gate. When he saw us, he lifted an eyebrow at me when he caught sight of Kale. The two traded grips, and when Kale asked him what he did here, Tobias smirked with downright condescension. I am the lead horticultural scholar for this garden. I assist the lady with her projects and help maintain the exhibits within the walls. Ah, so you would be as responsible for these supposed perversions of nature as she then. Whoops, maybe they weren't going to be besties after all. I beg your pardon. There are no perversions of nature here at all. The lady is a force of nature, plain and simple. To act outside of the natural order would be as unheard of for her as to destroy it. Perhaps I should join the three of you to help add perspective, he said, glancing at Randy. As a lady's proxy or whatever, I would appreciate that, Tobias. He nodded smugly and fell in with us, explaining the intricacies of the vegetables, many of them far larger than I had ever seen them grow. That's when someone came and pulled on my arm. I turned to find Anne, one of the few child Brandilo, standing beside me and looking sheepish. She was far older than her twelve-year appearance would lead many to believe, but she still seemed unsure of herself most of the time. She was glancing at the auditor, looking like she was hoping not to be noticed, and when I asked her what was wrong, she called me a few feet away so he couldn't hear us. Anne had a high voice, and she was aware that it sometimes carried. Apparently, whatever was going on, she didn't want anyone to know. There's a problem with the pumpkins, she whispered, and I had to bend down low to hear her properly. What's wrong with the pumpkins? I said, looking at a particularly large specimen in the garden behind me. It's, it's the ones with the faces. They aren't, they aren't acting right, she elaborated. I glanced back at Randy, and he seemed to sense that something was amiss. He glanced at the auditor, engaged in a conversation with Tobias, and nodded a single time before turning back. Show me, I said, and Anne and I went swiftly to the pumpkin patch. As we came into the farm area, I could see other Brandilo coming to gawk at the pumpkin patch. It was an impressive collection, but it had been the focus of the lady's attention for a while. She had been working to make the faces scarier, the visages more horrific, and she had been pouring a lot of power into the simple gourds. I had to admit she had done a great job. These pumpkins were far more unsettling than they had been a few weeks ago, and they looked ready for the background of any horror movie. They were still half uncut and half cut, but the half that were cut glowered from the rows with hateful eyes and lolling mouths full of pumpkin teeth. The jumping and the thrashing, as they attempted to disconnect themselves from their stalks, however, was new. How long have they been doing this? I asked Anne, my hands sitting on my cudgel as though not sure whether it was going to be needed or not. Not long, Anne said. The lady came by and used her powers to alter them again, and... After she left, they started doing this. We looked for her, but we don't know where she's gone, and we heard there was a stranger here that made her mad, and now we're scared to go find her, because what if she's mad at us? And Anne took a deep breath, but I put a hand out to stop her, 
before she could get rolling again. And it's okay. We'll figure something out here. I want you to go look for the lady while I see what can be done about this, okay? She sniffed a little, nodding as she took off towards the lily pond at breakneck speed, her little hooves clattering on the cobbles. I turned back to the pumpkins and shook my head. This was a little much, even for this place. The leering visages had turned towards me, the collective jerking at the long green umbilicus that connected each of them to the ground as they attempted to break free. Something was clearly off here. If Kale saw these, then we could be in for some trouble. These weird pumpkins probably fell under the heading of anomalies, and they may have even been what had sent him here at the start. I took up my cudgel, looking around to see how many other brandy low I had at my disposal. Three or four, most of them with rakes or hoes. They would be more than enough to hold back the tide. Besides, the damn things were attached to the ground. It wasn't like they were going anywhere. The first one pulled itself loose with a squelchy pop, and the others weren't far behind it. Uh-oh, I said, turning to the others to tell them to get ready. They had their farm implements in hand, ready to stand off whatever this was, and as the leering gourds began to approach, I thought about how fighting a bunch of grinning, moving jack-o'-lanterns was not how I expected to spend my afternoon. As they broke their bindings, the pumpkins began to move towards us with purpose. What their purpose might be, I wasn't sure, but I really didn't want to find out. Gourds or not, their teeth suddenly looked very real, the hate-filled eyes very purposeful, and I wondered how much magic the lady had poured into them. Maybe this was the sort of thing that Randy had been worried about when she started taking power from Stragview. Maybe this was just an expression of her frustration and anger. Either way, it was about to become a problem. None of these pumpkins leave the area. Is that understood? I asked the other Brandilo. They grunted, gripping their weapons as the hopping, bobbing terrors came in on us. To us, this was a standoff, a real skirmish. But I imagine to anyone else, looking on, it would have seemed pretty ridiculous. My cudgel came whistling down on the lead pumpkin, and it broke open like a ripe sack of garbage as the seeds and pulp flew. There were about forty of them, all teeth and rind and anger, and despite their fearsome visage, they were not terribly formidable. For one, they couldn't do much beyond hopping at us. They had no arms and legs, so they were forced into a sort of waddling gait that pitched between a constipated shuffle and a half-hearted hop. This made them pretty easy pickings, but they did have numbers on their side, and my earlier observation about the teeth had been correct. Through some sort of magic, the usually squishy mouths were now painful and quite formidable. I had squashed two of them before the first one bit me, and I had to swallow a yelp as it threatened to crunch my ankle. The others weren't faring much better. The pumpkins came up to their knees, and you would have said that the four of us would have been more than enough, but you'd be wrong. They bumped over us, knocking against our knees and ankles, and a couple of the brandy low went down. The pumpkins were thankfully not heavy enough to crush them, but as I swung my cudgel and tried to keep my feet, I wondered what would happen if more than a few of them decided to jump on one of my friends. Help him! I shouted at Charles, the one with the hoe, and he moved over to Stanley, the other brandy low with a hoe, and swatted them away as he helped him back to his feet. Back to back, I called out, the four of us getting close so we could, hopefully, not be knocked back down. They ringed us in, snapping jaws and evil eyes, but that honestly made them easier to smack down. They slammed into our ankles, nipping and biting and we turned them to pulp just as fast. We broke them apart, scattered their innards, and after a few minutes, their numbers didn't seem so limitless. We turned them to compost, and 
even in the late afternoon, I found myself sweating. We stood there for what felt like hours, swatting and smashing and pulping gourds. I stifled a smile, thinking to myself that the next thing they would have would be a pie-baking contest on their hands. All this spent pumpkin, I laughed again, and not a single girl in Ugg boots with a cappuccino in sight. I laughed, and the other brandy low shot sidelong looks at me. Jesus, this was a mess. I was breathing heavily by the time they stopped slamming against us, and I didn't even get a chance to catch my breath. What is this? Her voice cut across us like a scythe, and the four of us turned to see the lady returning with Anne. She was no less beautiful than she ever was, but now there was a cold fury about her, and I hadn't seen it since the battle last year. That, however, had been an anger tempered by purpose. This was more akin to a teenager who had been told they couldn't go out after curfew. She was furious, her face pulsing with rage, and I had never felt closer to death than I did at that moment. And that was saying something, since I had already nearly died here once. How dare you, she growled, and Anne stepped away from her, eyes filling with tears. You know how much work I have, how much work there is to do, and yet you unmake everything I have worked so hard on. You set me back, M my lady, I do not interrupt me, she whispered, her anger building as her voice lowered. I am your maker, your lady, and you dare to then act like it, I shouted, finding myself just as done as she was. We had to destroy these things because they presented a danger to the garden. We had to clean up your mess because you've become so blinded by your desires that you're becoming blind to what's going on. She backed away, her anger shifting into fear so quickly that it scared me a little. You are a force of nature, my lady, and the thought of you being in anything other than absolute control of yourself is terrifying. She began to cry, and I reached out, feeling her shake as I took her hand. My lady, you aren't in control of yourself. Something is happening to you, and I can see it working on the rest of us. Your strength is our strength, and the strength we feel in you is strange. You've become strange to us, and it makes us feel like strangers to ourselves. She shook as I held her hand and it moved her body strangely. She appeared to jump in place like the static on a TV screen, her form wavering in my hands. It, it hurt my eyes to watch her, but I couldn't turn away. She was, she was my mother, my love, my friend, and my death, all in one package. She could call my life back at any moment, and she knew it. She chose not to, however, because, in many ways, we were all she had of a place that she would never see again. I'm... I'm sorry, she breathed, crying. I don't... I don't know what's happening to me. This is... different. It's not the same as it normally is. Something is strange, new, she faltered as she tried to find the words. Dark, she finally landed on, shuddering as she put a word to it. We'll figure this out, I promised her. It, it'll be okay. For now, though, we need to... Some of them got away, came a shaky voice over my shoulder. I turned and found Charles looking at me, his face a mask of confused dread. Who? The pumpkins... A couple of them got away. I turned to look at him, but I didn't drop her hand. They were all still here, and too, and I felt a little anger bubble up in me. Why hadn't they gone after them? Why, why had they just stood there and watched me? Why couldn't they do anything right? Why did they... I closed my eyes and took a deep breath. Her energy was... was really affecting us. 
We need to find them, I said, turning back as I let her go. How many were there? Four, Charles said. Uh, five, Stanley said. I, I only saw three, admitted Crystal. Uh, okay, split up and get them. Charles, you and Crystal go search the south. Stanley, you and I will go north. Keep them away from the auditor and let the others know to keep an eye peeled. Go. And what should I do? Came a small voice. I turned back to see the lady looking at me. Her tear-streaked face is beautiful, as it was horrible. You and Anne do something about all this. Don't start growing more until Kale is gone. I'll go get the ones that fled. If they come back, take care of them. With that, we all left in a hurry, setting out to find the lost gourds and hopefully stop them before they could affect the garden further. Stanley and I split up at the lily pond, deciding we could cover more ground that way. I was coming around the edge of the spooky forest when I saw it, the little pumpkin shuffling along as it glowered and hopped near the entrance. I crept up on it, hoping it was the last one. It hadn't seen me yet, and if I was careful, I could get in close before it... The trees are transplants from the largest natural cemetery in North America. The inventor actually plants human remains beneath them, and the bodies nourish the trees and make them grow to extraordinary heights. Fascinating, I heard Kale drone. And did they grow like this, or did the lady make the faces on them? Gentle manipulation, Tobias assured him. Crap, I'd expected them to be further along by now. I, I needed to get this thing before they saw it. This is really something, Kale said, sounding impressed. I didn't know humans had come quite this far. The connection between humanity and the trees would be astronomical. Also, since it doubles as a cemetery, the trees cannot be cut and the land cannot be developed. The pumpkin looked up, hearing them approach, and I made my move. A quick lunge, a hard swing, and... The wicked little thing fell in pieces by the path. I pushed the remains into the woods as they came up the trail and nodded at them as they approached. Ah, there you are, Tobias said. We thought we had lost you. I fell in behind them, and when Randy looked back, raising an eyebrow, I shot him a thumbs up. He looked relieved. The rest of the audit went fine, and when I saw Charles and Crystal, they flashed a thumbs up as well and I breathed a sigh of relief. The lady, to my surprise, met us at the gate and looked much calmer than she had earlier. She accepted Kale's report, listening to what he was saying, and assured him that these plants were only for seasonal use inside the park. Kale was happy to assure her that he had found no problems here within and would be telling Titania as much. The queen had heard the most outlandish claims I told the queen I put very little credence into such stories, but she insisted that we... He staggered a little as something bumped him, and I looked down in horror as I saw one of the grumpy-looking gourds ramming against his leg. Kale looked down, raising an eyebrow, and I thought for sure we were cooked. Randy glanced at me, asking too much to convey in a single glance. But when Kale bent down... To scratch the ugly thing along the stem like it was no more than a house cat, I blew out in relief. Where have you been hiding these? I haven't seen gordlings in a long time. They're so cute when they're this age, though very temperamental. The pumpkin creature seemed to look back at me, almost smugly, before returning to the rest of the park. Huh. Well, shit. The more you know. So, I will be happy to inform the Queen that the claims against you are unfounded. I see no breach of natural law here, as long as you do not mean to introduce any of these trees or creatures into the wild to spread. So long as they are kept here, then that is entirely fine. I don't believe many of them could exist outside the place anyway. Wait, was that the reason you came? Randy asked. I'm really not supposed to say it being a matter for the Fay Court, but... Kale thought about it for a moment, seeming to weigh his options, before leaning down to half-whisper. Queen Titania had been told by a 
reputable court member that you intended to introduce these plants into the nearby Appalachian countryside. Such a thing would upset the natural order of not just the earth, but also the world of the creatures who live in the area. Many of them have very particular ecosystems and diets, and if any new fauna were introduced, it would jeopardize that. It could also be highly detrimental to the creatures who serve both Queen Titania and Queen Mab. He took his leave then, as did the lady, the gordling hot on her heels. Randy, Tobias, and I shared a look. Message received. Someone had been spreading lies. We all know that someone in the court is gunning for the lady. The question is, who? The lady laughed as though this were the most ridiculous thing she had ever heard. Who would do such a thing? To what gain? She was stroking the gordling as it sat happily in her lap, but I couldn't help but notice the less than trusting looks I was receiving on the end of the little thing. Apparently it had a longer memory than I would have thought. Tobias, Randy, and I had formed a council in the security shed again, putting our heads together as we tried to figure out what this was all about. The security shed had been unanimously voted as the spot for clandestine meetings, and it seemed appropriate. It was where we always met to talk shop and discuss plans. So, why wouldn't we come here? This time was a little different, though, because I had insisted that we invite the lady, too. She hadn't wanted to come. She had been too busy, but I was coming to realize that she should have been involved before now. The plot was against her, after all, and it only made sense that she should be aware of it. We had kept the secret for now, mostly because we were uncertain of it, but this was a clear and precise message. They could bury us in bureaucracy without having to raise a blade, and that was the most terrifying thing of all. Probably the same person plotting against you at the banquet, I said, putting it out there so she could judge the threat. What? she asked, looking around at the three of us. Who? Why? Why has this been kept from me? Her gaze settled on Randy, and he didn't seem to like it much. We wanted to make sure before making accusations. We don't know fairy politics like the two of you do, and Tobias seemed to think that there might be some credence to the threat as well, so we began to form plans. Tobias didn't seem pleased about being brought into this, but he accepted it. It would seem, based on what Randy Second has reported, that Titania's champion is plotting against you. Why, Sander? the lady said, looking between the three of us like we might be pulling a joke. You're, you're serious, aren't you? Why, Sander would never do something like this. He has been champion of the court for centuries. He has always welcomed me warmly during court events. I cannot imagine that he would turn against me, especially in such an overt manner. I, I overheard a conversation during the event, something I was obviously not supposed to have heard, between Wysander and another who I didn't see. They were discussing their responsibilities and the matter of your imprisonment. Apparently, they had worked with the Green Man to seal you in the statue form. I saw you in, and they were very upset that you had broken free. The lady thought about that for a moment, worrying at her lip as she tried to put these thoughts together. Why... Why would they do that? I've always found a place within Titania's court. Her people adore me. We're like sisters, she and I. Whoever Wysander was talking to felt that you were a danger to the natural order, I said, unable to look at her as the anxiety wafted off her like a fever heat. I've, 
I've never intentionally tried to harm the natural order. I love this world order, and I've always tried to act within its framework. I think, I began, trying to find a way to phrase it without hurting her, that some of their fears might not be baseless. She looked at me, shocked, and I saw some of the rage within her trying to riot to the surface again. Ever since you've been taking sacrifices from Stragview, something has changed. You aren't yourself sometimes. You're more powerful, more capable, but some of that power has changed you. I know there have been times I've been afraid of what you might do. Sometimes I've been afraid to speak my mind, and that's not something I like seeing. We depend on you, depend on your strength, and, and fear is never something we should feel for our mother. She looked ashamed. I, I had no idea. I will admit, I have noticed that I'm prone to anger more than normal. Sometimes my emotions are just more than I can handle, she said, bowing her head. This, this changes some things. Why? Randy said, and she turned to look at him in surprise. Why should it change anything? So you feel a little more than normal. We all feel things. It's just another aspect of you, something that you have to learn to handle. As for the fairies, this don't change nothing. We have our place and they have theirs. Long as we don't mess with their precious order, they should have no reason to mess with ours, right? I get that we need allies and that we need help with the winter when it comes, but if they want to make trouble, then we can make trouble right back. So we'll play their little game and stay in their little tests, but at the end of the day, this is our place, and they can come skulking in here at their own peril. The lady was nodding, smiling at all of us, as she pulled the gordling against her chest. Thank you. I'm, I'm grateful to have your support and your devotion. She got up then, turning for the door. I must return to my work. I trust you three with my security and with the safety of this park. I am I'm proud to have such staunch defenders within my legions and such friends by my side. The happiness came off her like a warm summer day, and it took us a few minutes to stop smiling after she had gone. It's pretty clear, Randy said after some time, that our snooper wasn't from Kashmir Tribune. I think we had a spy from Wysander peeking in on us, if not the bastard himself. He would be risking much by coming himself. Fay do not often do in person what they can send a cat's paw to do instead. Had he come, he would have been undetectable, I fear, Tobias said. Will he try to bring more red tape, you think? Randy asked, but Tobias shook his head. No, I think it will be harder for him to be believed if he goes that route again. The next time he makes a move, it won't be so subtle, so benign. We will need to be on guard. We will be, I said, surprising even myself. We know he's gunning for us now, and next time we'll be ready. I pray it is so. Tobias said, because next time it may not be so easily sussed out. The Botanical Garden opened Monday, and the whole community nearly lost its mind over it. The Halloween festivities would persist all the way until October 31st, ending with a late-night spooktacular, and I don't think I've seen better sales on season passes the whole time I've been here. Some people came every night, sometimes twice, and the gardens were packed. Some of the dread seemed to have lifted from the place, now that the disappearances were less often, and people seemed less hesitant to come to the park. The lady had made more of the gordlings, having Tobias place a ward on the front gate so they wouldn't wander out, and people found them as spooky as they did fun. They wandered the grounds, making their way into places they hadn't been intended to be, and I was pretty sure I saw a group of gnomes riding a few of them as they lumbered along. They will prove useful in the future, the lady confided in me, 
Just imagine how the green man will flee when he sees his worst fear moving towards him. Her eyes sparkled at the thought, and I suppose that much like the gnomes, the gordlings were here to stay. So, for two weeks, the people came and experienced the haunted maze, bobbed for apples in the lily pond, carved pumpkins, marveled at the treats, and had a great time. Even Dr. Winters and her girlfriend came to take in the sights, exclaiming over all of it to the general approval of the lady. It's amazing, she said, as she picked up one of the candy apples. I, I can't wait to see what you do for Christmas. The lady's eyes suddenly grew merry, but to my surprise, she quenched it just as fast. I think we had more than enough excitement last year. This year will likely be very small, if we do anything at all. Dr. Winters looked a little sad to hear it, but I wasn't. The energy wafting from the lady was a little clearer, a little less hectic, and I think maybe she had figured out a better way to process her excitement. Whatever she was getting from Stragview or from the inmates that she accepted into the pond was being better utilized now and hopefully would continue to be in the future. The sacrifices were a needed evil, but how she processed them was up to her. She was the lady, and the power ultimately lay with her. As November 1st rolled in and the lady retired for some much-needed rest, the Brandylo sat about the bonfire, and we had our own little celebration. Wine was passed, food was eaten, furry bodies danced around the shifting flames, and merriment was in the air, as much as the music was. Randy and I sat on the outskirts, watching them as they capered as we reflected on the year. You know, kid, I wasn't so sure you were going to make it when I first saw you. Oh? I asked, grinning despite myself. I'm glad you proved me wrong. Makes me glad to know that if something should happen to me, the lady would have someone by her side. I think... I think I rest easier knowing that, especially knowing it's you. We touched wineskins and relaxed back into the grass that surrounded the bonfire area. Who knew what sort of adventures the new year might bring, and how many more adventures we may have to come before we got there. <laughs>